All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started this morning. Welcome, everybody, to the Evidence-Based Practice and Disability Disciplines Conference Day 2. Um, so far, I hear some good things, and people are enjoying themselves here. And they're also liking the food. I, I appreciate that, because I did order those, th th those things last night. All right. Um, I have a, yeah, you like the food, too. Good. All right. Um, I have a few housekeeping items this morning. One is, please silence your cell phones. Larry already has silenced his cell phone, so we're not going to get more disturbances up here. Um, but that, that's helpful. Please, everybody, do that. Also, um, make sure you're wearing your name tags. Okay. And the schedule of t for today is a little bit different, so please go by today's schedule and not yesterday's. So one of the things that's different is our, our break time. So in between the sessions is only 15 minutes instead of 30 minutes, which was yesterday's. So in this 15 minutes, what we're figuring is that you now know where everything is. You know where all the rooms are, especially the O'Leary that's in the, um, the jury across the, across the way. So um, I ask that you be uh, respectful to the presenters and try to get to your rooms on time, even though there's just that 15 minute break. Um, you should have enough time to grab a soda, grab a snack, and get to where you need to go. Um, in addition, we have adjusted the schedule for lunch, all right? So the lunch time is actually an hour and a half long, and for those of you who are staying, that should give you enough time to be able to check out, all right? Eat your lunch, check out, and the other thing that we're going to be, um, <coughs> excuse me, so the other thing is that we figure that at after a day and a half, you might need a little bit of a downtime. So there's great foyers um, towards this side of the restrooms and over there. So just go ahead and relax during the lunchtime, chit chat a little bit, but try to um, recoup a little bit because we have some great um, presentations for the afternoon sessions. Um, also at lunch, many of you will be receiving an email for a survey monkey evaluation. Okay, um, and if you don't receive an email and if you don't prefer to do the survey monkey evaluation, then you also have one in the back of your program. Okay, so, and then here are the directions. Those of you who are receiving and getting uh, continuing education credits for certified rehab counselors must turn in their evaluation form in hand to the registration desk. Okay, that's a requirement for those CEUs. Others, however, can turn them in a, in a variety of ways. You can either give them to your um, room monitor at the last session that you go to, return them to the registration desk, or do the survey monkey through the email. Okay. Um, for those of you who have only um, come for today, there's a few people that were not here yesterday. We have a, an app, a conference app called Twapi, and in the, on the page that says general information, there's a QR code so that you can get right to it or a website. In addition, there's a QR code for handouts, and these handouts are what some of the presenters have given in case you want to follow along during the presentation. It's more closely represented by their slides, um, and you can get to them through that website. So in terms of the evaluation, I wanted to point out that this is the experiment. This is our very first one, and we really, really need your feedback. Um, think carefully about the facilities, the format of the conference, the program, and the speakers. And in particular, if we're going to do this again, we need some suggestions about who we invite next, next time. So please, um, I really would appreciate your evaluation, um, although it's not required for most of you. Okay. All right, now I'm going to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Larry Latham serves as the Assistant Director of the Division of Developmental Disabilities in Arizona. Dr. Latham has been in the field of disabilities for over 40 years. He earned his PhD in experimental psychology from the University of Alabama with an emphasis in intellectual disabilities. He earned um, a bachelor's and a master's degree in psychology at North Texas University. And at the University of Virginia Medical College, he was an assistant clinical professor of psychiatry. He has served as an expert witness in Texas, Alabama, and California litigation. Dr. Latham is a fellow and a lifetime member of the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities and has served on the Alabama State Special Olympics Board for seven years. Don't worry, I, there's more. Hold on. Dr. Latham's early career was in mental health services. Some of his experiences include partnering with providers, advocates, and families in developing community programs to serve individuals with developmental disabilities and mental illness. 
He established Alabama's first program for persons duly diagnosed with autism and intellectual disabilities. As Virginia's Associate Commissioner for Community and Facility Services, Dr. Latham provided leadership and administrative oversight for 15 state facilities and coordinated service delivery with 40 community service boards. In Tennessee, Dr. Latham was involved in the development and oversight of quality improvement and compliance plans, including ending the wait list and creating the state's first four-person home lo four person homes located in community neighborhoods that served as intermediate care facilities for the intellectually disabled. Most recently, as a Deputy Assistant Commissioner for the Developmental Disabilities in the Georgia Department of Behavioral Health, Dr. Latham has served as CEO for 500 bed state psychiatric hospitals for persons duly diagnosed with developmental disabilities and mental illness. Wow, that is such a mouthful. He has done so much. I've had the opportunity to talk to Dr. Latham on a number of occasions, and each time he's told a story about a job he once had and often gives the year of to put this anecdote into context. Last night at dinner, he told a story about a job he started in March of 1967, All right, his first. I was taken back a bit, and I was like, wow, he can remember the year and the month that he, he started that job, All right? And not only that, that was 46 years ago. Wow, how can he remember that? And then I realized that Dr. Latham has 46 years of practice telling people about his job history. I don't know for sure, but my guess is that his job history is significant and meaningful to him. I think it should be significant and meaningful to us too. Because of his long and successful job history, the state of Arizona, the clinicians that work here, and all the consumers with developmental disabilities benefit. It's an amazing honor to have him speak to us today about the importance of evidence-based practice for policy and organizations. Please welcome Dr. Larry Latham. introduction like that, I hope you're not disappointed in my presentation. Back decades ago, when I first started my college education process, you know, the role of authority was still very alive and well. I don't think even the term evidence-based practice had even been thought of, much less defined. Uh, and so uh, you became an authority by publishing a lot of books and theories and philosophy. And it has slowly changed over the, the many decades. But uh, um, I'd like to read just a a snippet of a piece of a poem that means something to me. It said, myself when young did eagerly frequent doctor and saint and heard great argument about it and about, but evermore came out by the same door as in I went. Think about that. It has really been quite a revolution in the past 15, 20 years where we have started demanding proof. I have spent about 35 years, maybe 39 years, continuously prior to coming to Arizona in a DOJ CRIPA environment. And that was really my exposure to the, the need to, to adopt and implement state-of-the-art best practices in, in all areas of clinical endeavor around working with individuals in, with intellectual disabilities. But it's been quite a journey. Northern Arizona University and the Institute of Human Development has embraced evidence-based practice as a decision-making framework that involves the conscientious integration of the best available evidence, professional judgment, and clinical expertise, 
and client values, preferences, and contexts. To further that, they established this conference. They published quarterly bridge boot briefs, and they obviously provide training, support, and research synthesis. The uh, National Association of State Directors of Developmental Disability Services has adopted policies that say evidence-based policy recognizes that just as clinical practitioners, policymakers also share professional responsibility for the acquisition and application of the best available knowledge in their professional roles. But there are challenges, one of which is that many of these challenges derive from the fact that social research seldom produces unequivocal results. Indeed, most social research up to this time has not been done really uh, to influence uh, policy. Um, I'll talk more about that later. Another challenge arises from the fact that much of the available social research is not directly congruent with policy manipulative variables. What does that mean? It means it doesn't inform you about how to manipulate the uh, thought processes uh, that actually go into creating government policy. The NASDAQ's uh, and the uh, Association of University Centers on Disabilities have partnerships around evidence-based practice. They have agreed on seven areas. One is identifying the topics of highest importance or recurring attention in policy discussions within states and nation on which comprehensive and objective review of high quality research and evaluation is needed. Developing policy relevant summaries of research and evaluation. Creating a jointly supported website for the posting of research and evaluation summaries. Last night at supper we were talking about that very thing, is how do you really go about creating one single site that imports and synthesizes all of the currently available best practices, evidence-based literature on the entire subject range of intellectual disabilities. Because until we have that, it's going to be very difficult to integrate the, the findings. Uh, you know, put yourself in my position. You know, I, I have to, I have to have access through my, either both my own endeavors as well as numbers of staff constantly trolling probably 20, 25 websites looking for information about what is the current state of knowledge about a particular intervention. And that doesn't really work very well. Maximizing the use and benefits of national core indicators or other outcome assessment data sets. Developing capacities through cross usage technical assistance in states with the national core indicators or other outcome related data sets. Serving as a training opportunity to increase the expertise of graduate students and state staff in policy research and evaluation and undertake other activities with promise of increasing the effective gathering and use of best available evidence. Evidence-based practice, <coughs> we can either talk about a narrow or a broad definition. Within education, the term evidence-based practice is most often used to refer to a program or intervention that has been found to have strong research support. This definition 
focuses on the important issue of the research support for a particular program or intervention. However, it leaves the broader question of how or whether practitioners should go about balancing this information with other considerations on problem solving outside the scope of the evidence-based practice. Simply what it's saying is you're working with a, anytime you're working with anybody, you're talking about a very complex uh, organism embedded in a highly complex environment. And I don't know about you, but having spent a lifetime tr being a researcher or trying to use research, I become very leery of when I read a, a fantastic study and then I realize, well, this study was done by one or more doctoral level professors using many doctoral level graduate students in a very highly controlled laboratory environment. Why do I think I can implement this in a group home? Uh, and indeed, I have not found it to be very successful in trying to, to with high fidelity, implement such a program. You have to kind of cut and paste and work around the edges a little bit to, uh, to have the impact or even close to the impact that you hope to get. So things have got to change in the way we do our research uh, to inform policy later on. We suggest that the term evidence-based practice be reserved for the decision-making process and the term empirically supported treatment be used for activities that have been shown to meet specific criteria for research support. Simply put, there is less value in the research material if it does not inform the person who must determine what to do differently the next time they interact with the consumer. But there are some research gaps. There are many areas of treatment and practice for persons with intellectual disabilities where there is simply not sufficient high quality experimental evidence from which specific recommendations for practice can be made. And outside the studies involving interventions for individuals with autism spectrum disorders, the replicated evidence for treatment using single subject or group, method design, uh, group design methods is sparse. I decided oh, a couple of months ago it's time for me to spiff up my own research knowledge a little bit. So I bought a brand new textbook on um, power analysis and effect size calculations because that is now the, the current standard. Uh, no longer are you going to be able to do studies and simply produce a, uh, a statistical uh, analysis and say, well, this was significant at the less than the .05 level and, and that be accepted for publication. You, you have to deal with power analysis and effect size. And I have to say, I, I, I can only read a few pages at a time because it overwhelms me. I had no idea how many different measures of effect size there now are. And even in the single subject design literature, I've run across at least three methods recently for how do you aggregate single subject designs and there's no unanimity at this point um, in terms of which yields the best uh, information, um, at least under given the characteristics of the studies themselves. So we're not at a point where it is very user friendly to digest what is, in fact, out there. Given the importance of robust, durable, and meaningful treatment outcomes for persons with intellectual disabilities, assessment of generalization, maintenance, as well as social validity and acceptability of treatments 
are central to the evaluation of the usefulness of a treatment. It may be important for our field to determine whether we agree with and endorse the guidelines for quality and quantity of, su of studies required to recommend a practice as evidence-based. And I go back again to saying that, at least it's my belief, that there isn't a total agreement on what constitutes evidence. Uh, indeed, I wish I had, if I had attended the uh, sessions I attended yesterday, a few days ago, I might have rewritten some of, of what I'm saying because I learned a lot that I wasn't aware of. Uh, but it certainly is true that there are, there are many levels of evidence. <clears throat> but um, I'm not sure that there is, is full agreement on how you use those levels, particularly in the development of policy. Mark Twain wrote a short story many years ago. It had to do with two people were arguing as to whether or not Scott had discovered the North Pole. And one of the uh, two people was a noted scientist and professor. And after a lot of debate, the uh, professor finally said, well, it boils down to one of two things. If you're claiming that it was a miracle that Scott discovered the North Pole, then we have more than enough information. But if you're claiming it's a fact, you have to have evidence, okay? We are at an important point in the development of evidence-based standards for interventions. On the one hand, evidence-based treatments are foremost concern for our field in the presentation of guidelines for evaluating the quality and outcome of individual studies and the aggregate uh, outcomes of sets of studies. On the other hand, we have a relatively modest portfolio of experimental studies in which research, researchers specifically addressed important treatments of persons with intellectual disabilities. Much of the existing experimental evidence is based on single subject design and I've said before, there are challenges with aggregating these uh, studies. Despite growing acknowledgement within research communities that the implementation of research into practice is a complex and messy task, conceptual models describing the process tend to be unidimensional and at least suggest that there's some linearity and logic, and that's not so. Specific <coughs> empirically supported treatments are established by existing research. There are areas of poorly documented research passed off as empirically supported treatment. And there are areas of research done in sterile environments without thought of implementing in the real world, which I've already spoken to. But I'll give you another example. <coughs> 1984, April of 1984, <laughs> I don't remember the day, but it was April. Might have been April's Fool Day. I was made the state director <coughs> in Alabama. And in May of 84, I am a defendant in federal court being sued uh, by a family who had a 21-year-old autistic son who, in my experience, is probably was the most aggressive uh, indiv individual I can remember working with. And their experts claimed in federal court that the only place on earth capable of successfully working with this man was John Hopkins University's Autism Center. Well, I convinced the judge that since I'd only been in the job 30 days or less, I, I had a right to at least try using the available resources to me before I acquiesced to, to uh, send this person to uh, 
that program. And he agreed with me. Uh, needless to say, though, within a few months, I flew up, visited that program at John Hopkins for two days, worked out the admission of the individual, got the governor's airplane, flew his mother, his grandmother, the, the individual himself, and two staff members to John Hopkins, got him enrolled. <clears throat> In less than 48 hours, they kicked him out. I don't you think? Well, what it turns out is that this program was embedded in the larger hospital. And while the behavior analysts and the graduate students that ran that program had control of their program, they didn't have control of the nurses. Because the nurses are the ones that demanded he be kicked out because he was beating them up. Our research doesn't always fit the reality of life. Okay? No question about it. It's an, it was, and I, if it still exists, it, it is an excellent program. Did a lot of good work. But when the rubber meets the road, there are many complexities in implementing high quality programs uh, in the real life environment. For example, the National Academy of Science evaluated educational research generically and found methodologically weak research, trivial studies, an infatuation with jargon, and a tendency toward fads with a consequent fragmentation of effort. That was some time ago. So what does the future hold? Well, I've already mentioned, we have joint efforts with agency and university partnerships, such as the, the NASDAQ and the uh, AUCD. Uh, one of my reasons for being here is, is to talk with the leaders of, of uh, the Institute, because I really want to create much stronger and, and more regularly used avenues to cross-pollinate and, and support each other uh, as we go forward in this state. There's a need for more research and improved research designed such there's translation to policy and or to practice implementation, and I should say real life practice implementation. And realize that evidence-based practice is an essential, but not the sole factor to improve quality of care. Public sector agencies often have a workforce with varied levels of education and considerable workloads, have multiple responsibilities, and have few readily available venues for knowledge sharing. Conceptual models of implementation phases and factors do affect the implementation, and there are four main areas, exploration, adoption, active implementation, and sustainment. <clears throat> Someone suggested we put in some examples of evidence-based practice that the division currently uses. Uh, we do use the National Guideline Clearinghouse. Uh, we have implemented practices around diabetes type 2, COPD, congestive heart failure, pneumonia, asthma, high frequency uh, chest wall oscillation vest, and we adhere to or try to uh, the clinical guidelines for applied behavior analysis. But here's a conceptual model that recently created and uh, is recommended for public service areas. I said earlier that, that uh, conceptual models ten, tend to imply a linear process uh, and a logic. This, I hope, with the errors coming back, what that is showing is basically a feedback loop that yeah, it does progress from exploration to sustainment, but all along the way, the sustainment, whether or not it's sustained, still relies on a continuing 
exploration, decision making, and active implementation. Uh, and let's just look a little bit at some of the areas that that fall within that. In exploration, the first thing is the social political content. <coughs> And there's a reason that's first. Because without, it doesn't matter how great the evidence is. It doesn't matter how strong the evidence is. If the political environment is not supportive of implementing it, it ain't going to get implemented. And even if it's implemented, it's not going to be funded for long. Okay? Indeed, and I'll try to talk about this a little later. Um, to me, actually, the biggest hurdle is not the designing of experiments to answer real-life questions and the and ability to aggregate the information uh, and produce them on websites for professionals to read. It's how do we impact the citizenry at large. The information has got to be put out in a way that affects people. Take a look at uh, what do we already know? Um, saw some data the other day. <clears throat> Roughly 60% of the people that DDD serves in this state uh, have not been immunized for pneumonia. And guess what? The leading cause of hospitalizations is due to what? Yeah. Now there's there's evidence-based practice, certainly, that uh, pneumovax uh, is very effective. It's not effective for all types of pneumonia, but it is effective for, for pneumonia. And yet, the citizenry hasn't adopted it. Whether they just don't believe it, uh, whether it's economics that get interferes, you know, there, there's a host of reasons. But it is, it is capturing the mind of the population, the citizenry of the state, that's most crucial to influence whether or not an evidence-based practice is going to be adopted. That's our challenge. You know, people are... Apparently, lots of people are far, far, far better at manipulating the Internet than we are because you can find the damnedest theories out there with a very little effort. <laughs> uh, everything from aliens to what have you. But we don't influence public opinion very well. Uh, and I'm not certain I know why. But there is the crux of the matter. So what does the future hold? The above model is one that was suggested for public sector. Uh, it's increasingly recognized that improved services and public sector services is influenced as much by the process of implementing innovative practices as by the practices selected for implementation. As noted throughout this report, a wide variety of community-based services are proven value for even the most severely mentally ill. Yet a gap persists in the broad introduction and application of these advances in service delivery to local communities, and many people with mental illness are being denied the most up-to-date and advanced forms of treatment. That's from the Surgeon General. What does the future hold? Well, clearly, the national emphasis is rapidly moving toward evidence-based practice. The state agencies will need to become familiar with the literature and gear up for the integration into contracts and policies. Also, organizations will need to consider how such information can be distributed best in their particular context. Organizational information for decision making, there are a number of them. While these data sets exist, there is no single source for synthesized data 
in a user-friendly format for states to translate into policy, or I should say to use to educate those individuals that we need to, in, to educate to s support us. Evidence in foreign policy is not simply an extension of evidence-based medicine. It is contextually different. These contextual differences notwithstanding, the pursuit of evidence-based policy is found foundationally aligned with evidence-based practice. Both are founded on the premise that healthcare decisions should be informed by the best available evidence and should include a rational analysis. Michael Hogan, Commissioner of Mental Health in uh, Ohio, refers to a triangular relationship. Quality improvement, accountability through performance measures, and evidence-based practice. Implementing evidence-based practices is a quality improvement process that provides accountability through the monitoring of the fidelity of practice models that have been demonstrated by research to be effective. There continues to be much room for clinical judgment, right choice, and development of innovative treatments and services. Without informed and committed administrators and policymakers, no amount of literature or evidence will matter, and no amount of accountability through measures of fidelity will increase public commitment to seeking or funding mental health care. I'll digress a minute. <coughs> About 15 years ago, I was involved in a very high-level policy discussion in a state far, far away from here where the political analysts and advisors to the governor were wanting to strip uh, a lot of funding from services. And I was the sole person representing the department in that meeting trying to explain to them, but yeah, but you just signed an agreement with the Department of Justice to implement these uh, settlement agreements. And if you do what you're proposing to do, you're going to get our ability to implement them, and you're going to be back in federal court. Well, that meeting went on about an hour. And at the end of it, one of the governor's advisors said, why do we let these people live? That's 15 years ago. It occurred in 1939 in Nazi Germany. If you think it couldn't occur here, you're wrong. All it would take is the belief and probability that you wouldn't experience any consequences to yourself if you enacted such a policy. Okay? Now, that was chilling for me. In fact, I quit that job shortly after that. <coughs> but uh, the context, the information, the understanding of what works and what doesn't work and what's beneficial and what isn't beneficial is the fundamental peer, in my opinion, to move forward with the adoption of policies and practices that are grounded in real fact. Regulations often impede the implementation of evidence-based practices. It is not possible to deliver state-of-the-art treatments if, for example, Newer antipsychotic medications are not on the formulary of a program, or diapers for that matter. It is always important to be culturally sensitive and respectful of diversity when designing and delivering services. It is a simple truism that a service system runs on its financing policies. If evidence-based practices are not covered services, or if the fees paid are below the cost of providing them, they will not be used. 
you can look at our own National Corps indicator data and see that uh, there are a number of, of things that are considered quality that are not being very well implemented in, in this state. Undoubtedly, to a large extent, because of the rate cuts that occurred over the last few years. And one of the examples I'll give you is that you cannot, you cannot claim to have community integration if the people who are living in the community do not get out of the homes and involved in day-to-day -day activities just like you and I. It's one thing to take a busload of people to the mall, whether they wanted to go or not, versus taking each of the three or four individuals living in the home to where they wanted to go by themselves with, with a, a staff member if necessary. Wholly different thing. But without the adequate resources, uh, it, it's just not going to happen. There are potential <coughs> circumstances where evidence-based practice may be counter to the economic self-interest of some professionals. And there are existing evidence-based practices which are not implemented due to funding considerations. As you know, in Arizona, adult dental is not currently a covered service under the Medicaid waiver. It was, uh, but it took a cut at the same time that the budget crisis occurred and has not yet been reinstored. That I have submitted as one of my wish lists for next funding cycle. <coughs> Some evidence-based practices are easier to implement, especially those that promise lower cost. Medical-based practices are more inclined to be more developed around evidence-based practice, such as uh, pneumonia prevention, treatment protocols, again, the high-frequency chest wall oscillation therapy. Therapies-based practices tend to, uh, that are similar to medical practices, also tend to be um, more influenced by evidence-based practice. Some evidence-based practices are more challenging to implement. Translating research into practice requires sound policy development, effective communication at the federal and state level, development of clear contractual expectation, effective communication at the agency level down to the field level staff who must then implement the practices within the environment where the consumers live, work, and play. To implement uh, evidence-based practices, we have to identify and improve local level and provider implementation strategies. We have to remember that we are supporting people as they live their lives. Consumer and family input is crucial in choosing the best fit for implementing supports and services. And there are probably others that I didn't even mention. But getting the consent of the people that we serve is, is so fundamental. I'm probably one of the worst patients you can imagine. Uh, there's a severe negotiation between me and my docs uh, as to what I will or will not do. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I have a, a doctor friend in, in another state that her conception of it was a partnership. The doctor told you what to do and you did it. That's, that ain't going to work for me. Uh, <laughs> you know. In fact, I've had some of my uh, primary care physicians acknowledge that I was a pretty talented amateur. <laughs> and I'm, I'm proud of that. I, <laughs> so I, I know what I'm willing to do and what I'm not going to do, and we shouldn't expect anything different when we're working with, with the people that we've been entrusted to deal with. That in concludes my formal presentation, and I think we've got a couple of minutes. So uh, if anybody would like to make a comment or ask a question, feel free to do so. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
<clears throat> all I can say is not in the six months I've been here. I, I, don't, I don't know the history. Um, of course, one of the things, one of the challenges we have uh, <clears throat> is, uh, is managing the data. We have a, a huge amount of data available to us that goes unanalyzed. Uh, there, for many reasons, it's not easy to access it. It's not uh, there's not enough staff time available to analyze it. It's 57th on the priority list of crises that we're dealing with. <coughs> there, there are a number of of reasons why we don't do a better job with with data than we do. Uh, that's something, again, I have warned providers that it is my intent within two to three years to start publishing provider report cards. <coughs> uh, that we will go through a process and identify the really important variables. And I am of the old school. I do appreciate uh, opinion questionnaires, uh, attitude questionnaires. But I also like to see a count. I, I want to know how many people died. I want to know why they died. I, I want to know who's falling and where they're falling and what time of day they're falling and, and, uh, and the medical conditions they may have had. <coughs> uh, there are some what I would call more empirical outcomes that I'm equally in, uh, interested in collecting along with did you have a good experience with, you know, this service? It's valuable, but I want both. Anything else? Thank you very much. Do I just pull this out? Thank you so much, Dr. Latham. Wow. Okay, so we have um, time to get to our next session. Everybody got their plan ready? Go. Dita, can you raise your hand for the people who need to have their things signed? Thank you, good question. <laughs>